Great, so I think I'll get started. Uh, just, as a, just as a note, you've noticed I have an accent. I tend to speak a little quickly. So at any point, if something I've said is unclear, please let, re, flag me down, ask me to repeat it. I won't get offended. It happens all the time. Great. So my name is Rohit Naimpaldi. I've worked at JPAL in various capacities for about six years now, but JPAL North America specifically for a couple of months. And I just want to give you a broad overview today about what we mean when we say evaluation, why you should care, and why you should care specifically about randomized evaluations. And then to, at the end, we're hoping to have a large amount of time to do a little group work so we can just think out loud together. And we'll have a lot of terrific JPAL staff around to help you out. Great. So just a broad overview, let's talk a little bit about why you should evaluate. So if you're, if you're here, I think that's a reveal preference that you all already agree that we probably need to evaluate a number of programs. But just bear with me for the maybe one person in the audience who's still a skeptic. So let me take you to Chicago, a city very near and dear to my heart. And in addition to being the home of the 2016 World Series champion, Chicago Cubs, is also home to a serious homicide problem. Less, less fun. So between 2008 and 2010, over 600 Chicago public school students were shot and killed. If you're, some of you may be familiar with a, a group called Homeboy Industries that's based in California. Their idea is to work with gangs and try to reduce violence through providing people jobs and social programs. And there's very at the time, there was limited causal evidence that such employment programs can actually reduce crime, can re generate a reduction in crime. It seems like a bit of a stretch. How can giving people jobs reduce crime? Chicago has had a program called One Summer, One Summer Chicago, I believe, and fairly large budget, which provides both after school and summer jobs to youth. They suspected that maybe this program reduces violence, maybe it provides kids soft skills, maybe there's just an incapacitation effect where you're keeping kids off the streets, and so they have less time to go and shoot each other up. So one of our affiliates, Sarah Heller, said, fine, let's evaluate this, right? So they decided to work with a number of, I believe it was about 1,600 grade schoolers between 8th and 12th grade to evaluate this program. So one summer, I believe this in the summer of 2012, they went in, worked with a number of these youth, and they randomly had half the youth get this one summer Chicago Plus program, and half the youth didn't, right? And all the program was was a, was a summer job about 25 hours a week, and they wanted to see what's going to happen, what's the impact of this on violent crime. Before I give you the punchline, anybody want to guess? Do you think they saw an impact, didn't see an impact? Saw a massive impact, actually. 43% decline in violent crime arrests. Not just that, many of you care about this from a health perspective, from a public health perspective. A similar evaluation in New York of the summer youth employment program saw an 18% decrease in mortality. That's huge. I mean, being able to pick up anything on mortality is pretty big. For those of you who've taken a statistics or an econometrics class, mortality is typically an indicator used as an example of something that you're never going to be able to measure an impact on because it's so noisy. So that's pretty remarkable, right? And this framing just goes to show that sometimes an evaluation can give you some pretty striking results. Not just that, if you're working as a practitioner or an implementing partner looking for funding, an evaluation that dem demonstrates impact can, get, can crowd in a lot of funding. With One Summer Chicago Plus in particular, the Magic Johnson Foundation donated about $10 million to help scale the program up across Chicago. Mayor Rahm Emanuel, in one of his few popular moves, decided to scale this program up as well. And it got tremendous press and media coverage. US News, Washington Post, New York Magazine, and it made a star of Sarah Heller. So great. That's maybe why you should care about evaluation, right? Now let's step back a little bit and say, well, what do we mean when we say evaluation? A lot of times we hear, we evaluated this program, we didn't evaluate our program. At JPAL, we talk about evaluation in a very specific way. And just so we're all on the same page, I want to preview that a little bit. All right? So like I said, evaluation, very broad space. When we talk about program evaluation, which is typically what we're doing, we're evaluating a certain program or intervention. That's just a subset of different types of evaluations. Right? We're not talking about a general audit of your finances. We're talking about evaluating whether your program does what it says it's doing. And a subset of that is impact evaluation. So what do we mean? Say you're working on a program, right? How do we distinguish just creating a program to actually evaluating the program once you have it? Program creation, you start with a problem. So with the summer youth program, you said, well, we think kids don't have enough opportunities to stay off the street, so we're going to give them a summer job. 
With the program evaluation, you'd start with a similar question, but you want to know whether the program works. You say, all right, you have this program that's providing jobs. Now, do you think it's actually A, giving kids jobs they want, and B, helping get the outcomes you desire? First step in program creation is to actually verify that the problem exists, right? There are some places that have very, very low homicide rates. You might want to think, well, is providing this program even worthwhile there? With program evaluation, you want to think, well, do we have epistemic closure on this? Do we think the question's been answered or not? There are some things where we have pretty good evidence on what works and what doesn't work. People might differ on what works or not. I don't know where you fall on the vaccines question, but anyway. Oftentimes, you might not even need to do an evaluation. You can just do a literature review, right? Program creation, you'll generate a theory for why you think the program exists. So something like summer jobs, you might say, well, kids don't have opportunities. They're just out and about. Maybe we think giving kids opportunities, giving them a stable source of income, giving them a source of hope, maybe that'll, maybe that'll help reduce homicides, right? Program evaluation, you turn that into a hypothesis. You say, we think giving kids this program will help reduce violent crime, right? Let's skip through this. Great. So what are the various components of a program evaluation? You have the needs assessment, right? So you first say, what is the program, program we're actually trying to tackle? What is the problem we're actually trying to tackle? Sorry. Then you go to your theory of change. How in theory do you think providing this program is actually going to help address the problem? Sorry, I know all of this is very basic, but sometimes it just helps to put it all down and think through, think through how you're even thinking about addressing your problem. Then you have a process evaluation. And this is really, really important, right? Does the program actually work as planned? Go back to the summer youth program, employment program, right? You say, well, we think giving kids summer jobs is going to help reduce violent crime. Well, what if kids went up and all of a sudden some of the employers balked and they didn't actually provide the program? So you had all these kids who nominally signed up for the program but didn't actually get to participate in the summer program. There it might not be a breakdown of your theory. It might just be that the program didn't deliver as it was supposed to. And then you do your impact evaluation, which is what we do a lot of, or what a lot of our researchers do, where you say, well, once we implemented this program, did it actually achieve the outcomes that it, was, it set out to do? Did providing kids with summer jobs actually reduce violent crime or reduce mortality in New York? Right? And I see some of you are taking notes. We'll be sharing the slides with you. I'm happy to share the slides, so don't feel like you have to scribble uh, if you think there's something valuable up there. And finally, cost effectiveness. You want to actually look at, well, great, this, maybe this achieved an impact, maybe didn't achieve an impact. Did it do so in a cost-effective way? Or is there a cheaper alternative that we should be looking at? Right. I want to go back to the earlier point I raised about a theory of change, because this is really, really crucial. And it's a key part of drawing out your program evaluation, is thinking, well, what are the various steps along the way that need to happen for us to actually go from provision of program to achieving this outcome. And here's why. We need to distinguish between implementation failure versus a theory failure. So in an ideal world with a successful intervention, you provide an input, you undergo activity. So you say, with the inputs, we're going to provide funding to scale up this program. Activities, we're going to get a lot, whole lot of people on board to provide summer jobs. We're going to sign up youth to get these jobs. Outputs, kids are actually working on these jobs. Outcomes, kids' income goes up and they're spending less time out and about, or, or maybe engaged in activities that you think need to be reduced, and ultimately you get your goal of reduced violent crime. Right? If you had an implementation failure, say a lot of employers said, it's great you have funding, but we just don't want to employ these youth. That's not a problem. That, that doesn't even address the fact of whether jobs would help reduce violent crime or not. And that's just a problem of implementation. Similarly, you could have a theory failure where after your impact evaluation, if you found, oh, look, providing summer jobs didn't lead to a reduction in violent crime, that's not a commentary on whether summer jobs are good or bad. That's just commentary on whether or not it might actually help to achieve your stated goal of reducing violent crime. All right? So let's talk a little bit more about measuring impact. And I'm trying to breeze through a lot of this because I do want us to spend a significant amount of time on group work because it's usually just much more helpful if we talk through this aloud. Great. So how does impact differ from process? Oftentimes, you see process evaluations. 
as distinct from impact evaluations, right? With process evaluations, they're saying what actually happened. It's more descriptive, right? Did kids actually get jobs? Did they actually go and work on these jobs? The impact question is what would have happened if these kids had not had those jobs? What would have happened if they hadn't gone and worked in these jobs? Right. In order to do that, you need to think about the counterfactual. You need to think about a world in which these kids weren't working in these jobs, right? For those of you who weren't here this morning, Quentin, Quentin already showed this. I apologize for those of you for whom it's a repeat. But just to take you back, say you have a program, right? You're looking at an outcome. Say that's violent crime. This is what you observe. If this had been the counterfactual, you would have seen an impact. But it's equally possible that the counterfactual could have been up and your impact went in the opposite direction, right? So how do you get a sense of what that counterfactual is? Remember, all we observe is the world we're in. We can't observe the alternative, alternate world, right? I, I, I don't know how many of you read the Harry Potter books, but, there's one, but in one of the books, Hermione has this time traveler thing so she can go back and take multiple classes, but we don't have that, right? And so we only observe what we observe. So the best we can do is try to mimic the counterfactual or try and construct a comparison that closely approximates what the world might have looked like without our program. And then we compare those two to see, well, what impact did our program have? Right. So how do you select the comparison group, right? You want to be able to select the comparison group in a way such that the only difference between the group that isn't receiving your program and the group that is receiving your program, any differences between them after the program are attributable to the program itself. You don't want what are called confounding factors, right? You don't want other alternative explanations coming in. So really, all of which is to say you want to be comparing apples to apples, right? So what we often do is we select a group that most closely approximates our group that's getting the program in order to compare them to. Great. So what are the different evaluation methods, right? I'm going to run through a few of these. You could do a pre-post analysis. You could do a simple difference analysis. And just previewing the punchline, I'm going to try and convince you that oftentimes a randomized evaluation helps you solve a lot of the problems that the other evaluations come, uh, methodologies come with. That's not to say that you should always do a randomized evaluation or that every other method is flawed. It just me, it all, it's just to say that this has fewer assumptions that underpin it and it can give you more credible estimates. Great. So I'm going to do this by way of an example from a voting campaign in the US. Now, just to give you said this is actually a big problem. Voter turnout is a big problem. Now we're, we just passed election season. But in the US especially, voter turnout is shockingly low compared to OECD countries. I believe in this election, we're going to get maybe close to 59% of the electorate turned out to vote. Uh, by comparison, in countries like Belgium and Sweden, that's closer to 90%. Right? In the midterm elections in 2000, I believe the midterm elections in 2014, it was an all-time low, it was lowest since the 19th century, and something like 35% of the electorate turned out. So voter turnout is a massive problem in this country, whether you, just from a pure civics perspective, but I can show you why getting people to turn out could have a pretty big impact on who wins an election, right? I also want to demonstrate that what method you use for evalu evaluation really, really matters. This isn't just an academic debate about, well, what's more credible, what's more believable. It can actually produce really different estimates of impact. And this is why you should care. So two political scientists, Alan Gerber and Don Greed, said, we spend a lot of money on phone banks and calling people and trying to get them to come out and vote. Does this actually have an impact? Should we be putting all these resources in, into getting people to come out and vote? Right? So what they did was they compiled a list of 100,000 individuals who could vote in an election. And they said, well, we're going to call a subset of them. Standard get out the vote practice. You're going to make a call and say, hey, it's really important. Go out, vote. Doesn't matter who you vote for. Just go out and vote. Right? Now let's say we just want to evaluate what the impact of this get out the vote program is. What are various ways in which you could do it? Right? Well, you could do a pre-post analysis where you say, we're going to take the people who received the call, look at what their turnout was after the call, and then look at how, what the turnout rate for that group was before they received the call in a prior election. So maybe I take all the people in this room, I'm going to, give you, I'm going to call you guys, and I'm going to say, well, uh, look at how, what, what your turnout was in the next is in the next election, and compare it to what your, how, what your turnout was in the previous election, right? And when they did that, they found that these calls 
led to a seven percentage point drop in turnout, right? Slightly worrying. But then a skeptic could put his hand up and say, hang on, hang on, hang on. You don't know that it wasn't just the call. Maybe people were so disillusioned with politics that they weren't just going to turn out and vote at lower rates anyway. There's a lot of reasons to be disillusioned with politics these days, especially with voting politics. And maybe your call had nothing to do with it. They said, what you really need to do is compare them to another group of people. I said, fine. What we're going to do is we're going to take all of you, look at the rate at which you voted after you received the call, and take maybe all the people in the Taylor room and the Luscombe room and look at the rates at which they voted. They didn't get the call. So they did an analysis like that, and they found that the calls led to a 10.8, almost 11 percentage point increase in voter turnout. Huge impact. They're saying, wow, this has a terrific impact. Another couple of skeptics put their hand up and say, hang on. How do you even know you're comparing people who are similar? Maybe you just have people who are more civic-minded in this room. Maybe people think it's a duty to call. Maybe the people you can reach through a get-out-the-vote call are more likely to go out and vote anyway. I think for all the hate that's directed towards millennials, millennials turned out at a reasonably high rate in this election. Millennials are also much more likely to have cell phones versus landlines, right? Say you're only calling, say you're only calling cell phones. Maybe you're just going to reach a population that's more likely to turn out. How can you say this is a credible estimate? What happened? So they said, all right, let's try and account for inherent differences between the two groups. So one of the key things is, are these two groups just, fun do they have fundamentally different baseline levels of turnout? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the rate at which you guys turned out in the last election. The people in the Taylor and the Luscombe rooms, we're going to look at what rate they turned out in the last election. And then after the call, we're going to look at the two rates and then take the difference of the differences. So this is called a difference in difference analysis, right? And what you're trying to do there is just kind of sift out any inherent differences that existed between the groups. And when they did that, what did they find? Still a positive impact, but slightly smaller, 3.8 percentage points, right? Now, again, I mean, I imagine all of you have seen that this is also a little problematic because the only difference between you guys and the people in the Taylor and the Luscombe room might not just be your base levels of turnout. There might be something totally else, right? Maybe you people are wealthier. Maybe you have a car and you can drive to the polls much more, much more easily. Maybe there's some other factor that's going on. Maybe something happened between you receiving the call and the polls that's different from the people in the other room, right? And so just by virtue of the fact that those people selected into a different group and all of you selected in here, points to the fact that there are probably some differences between y'all that we can't necessarily account for. And so they said, all right, you win. We'll do a randomized experiment. So what did they do, right? They identified all the individuals who were eligible to vote. I think this was done in Iowa. I may be wrong. So within a county in Iowa, identified the electorate, right? And they say, we're going to randomly assign some of the individuals in that voting population to receive a get out the vote call and some individuals should not receive it. So I'm going to take all of you, I'm going to randomly pick half of you to receive the call and half of you to not receive the call. And then they said, once we've done that, at the end of it, we'll measure the difference between those groups. And because they've been randomly assigned, we think that these two groups are comparable. And what did they find? Zero no impact of those get out the vote calls. Now, there's a whole lot of other literature on get out the vote calls. Don't take this as a referendum on whether get out the vote calls work or not. Uh, this was this, in this particular instance, calling people had no impact on turnout. And again, just to give you a sense of why you should care, I think when all the numbers are finally done and counted, Hillary Clinton would have won the popular vote by anywhere between one and a half and two percentage points. Just look at those sizes, right? She lost Michigan by less than half of a percentage point. You get an effective get out the vote campaign going, you could swing an election. So this is a really important question, which is, again goes back to why you should really care about evaluation. Now, you may not be working on a get out the vote program, but if you're working on a healthcare program, you're still dealing with people's lives, right? This also goes to show just how important your evaluation methodology can be. Regardless of which you think the best methodology is, what this shows is that your methodology matters because it can produce widely differing estimates. But why should you care that randomization is the methodology you, methodology you pick, right? Because we believe that randomization in expectation produces two comparable groups more often than not. And here's why. Remember with the difference in difference method, 
I said, well, we're going to try and account for differences in baseline voting levels, right? Now somebody says, well, maybe wealthier people vote at different rates than less wealthy people. So I say, fine, I'm going to control for your income. If you've ever seen a standard regression analysis, you can just add control variables in, right? So I'm going to try and sift out any differences due to income. And somebody says, well, hold on. Maybe, there's a, maybe age plays a factor. Maybe younger or older voters vote at different rates. And so I throw age in. And so there are all these things you could keep throwing in. But then there may be factors you can't even measure that you can't account for. More, vote, more civically minded people, how are you going to me measure civic mindedness? That's really hard to do. With randomization, you don't even really need to measure those things that you need to sift out, right? All you do is with a large enough sample, you say, well, I'm going to randomly pick who gets this versus who doesn't. And so in expectation, these two groups should look roughly similar. Now, that's not to say that every individual in the group that receives the program is going to have an exact counterpart in the other. It's just to say that, on average, the two groups are comparable. And so if you're comparing average outcomes in the two groups, you get a credible estimate. And in practice, it's actually very simple. It's just like running a lottery or flipping a coin, right? So say I want to randomly assign people in this room. Flip a coin, it comes up heads. I say, Kenya, you're getting the program. I flip it. It comes up tails, I say, you're not receiving the program. And I just keep flipping the coin, and if it comes up heads, you get the program. If it comes up tails, you don't. In, a sense, in essence, that's what randomization is. So when should you consider randomization? Because some of you might be worried, well, it doesn't seem right to randomly assign it to people. Or more importantly, I got a question about this right before, is it ethical to do that, right? One situation in which you can do that is if your program is oversubscribed, and you're not going to be able to serve everybody anyway. Randomization might be the fairest way to do it. Amy Finkelstein is going to talk a little bit later about, uh, about the Oregon Medicaid experiment. There, when there was a Medicaid rollout, the people who signed up for the Medicaid lottery, there were way more people who signed up than they had slots for. In that case, why not randomize? You get to measure the impact of actually expanding health insurance coverage. In many ways, it's the fairest way to, assi to assign people to a program or not, right? What if a program is being rolled out? You say, fine. This program is going to expand anyway. We know it's going to happen. But what if we did it in a strategic way so we could just get a sense of whether this program's working or not? They did this with the deworming program in Kenya that Quentin mentioned this morning. The Kenyan government said, look, we're rolling out deworming anyway. It's going to happen. And so Michael Kramer, who's a researcher at Harvard, said, well, why don't you do it randomly if you're going to do it in schools? Randomly pick which, the order in which schools receive it, and then we can compare schools and then look at whether deworming has an impact on a whole host of outcomes that you wouldn't have even thought about. You found some pretty remarkable impacts. Expanding to a new area, very similar, very similar concept. And finally, if you're adding a new component, right? I'll just take you back to the original program in Chicago I was talking about. Some people said, do we really think it's the job, or do we think that there's some social and economic learning component? Do we think that there's just something more? Uh, maybe we should be giving people cognitive behavioral therapy. And so they tried an arm of the program where they added this additional program in. And they actually found that the impacts were very, very similar. And they said, no, actually, the jobs, that's what's doing the heavy lifting. And so then you want to think about whether you want to add another component to your program. So I'm going to stop yammering on there, because I think we have about half an hour to lunch, which is perfect. And so I want all of us to get into small groups and think about how you would design an impact evaluation. And rather than have to come up with a program, let me give you an example, right? Imagine that you're a healthcare organization, for many of you, you don't need to imagine that, that's targeting super utilizers of healthcare. That's very, very high cost patients, right? And you want to do this through a program of better, more coordinated care. Now you say, well, I'm interested in evaluating the impact of this program. How might you design an impact evaluation using any or all of these methods? And here are some of the questions to think about, right? When you say, well, I want to evaluate the program, what is the question or set of questions that you even want to answer? What do you even mean by impact, right? Who, what's your target population? We talked about super utilizers. Is that your target population? How are you going to draw on them? Who would serve as the comparison group? When you say, well, our program had this impact, you mean relative to what? So these are just some of the questions to think about. I think we have all of these questions written down on little worksheets that you can all work with. They were taught over there. I would suggest sort of organically splitting off into small groups. We have, could the facilitators just raise their hands? So we have Kenya, Hannah, Elizabeth, and Todd. So maybe if we form four groups, each of them could be in one group to help facilitate the group discussion. 
maybe spend about 15 to 20 minutes working through this in groups, and then uh, maybe we could just take 10 minutes to all share collectively what, what we came up with, what we learned, and then we can break for lunch. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. And if you're interested in learning more about a specific evaluation we're doing on super utilizers of healthcare with the Camden Healthcare Coalition, I encourage you to go check out that link. All right, so anyone want to maybe talk about what you talked about in your group about the question or set of questions that you'd like to answer using the impact evaluation? All right. Sure. I'm sorry, if you could just say your name and the organization or group you're with. Okay. Right. I'm Miriam Gregorian, and I'm with Harvard um, School of Public Health. And um, we were just talking about what the effect of this care coordination program would be and along what, which dimensions. So by effect, we mean like readmission, length of stay, um, health outcomes, cost effectiveness, patient satisfaction, um, medical professional satisfaction, social status, things like that. Uh, social status changes that result from the care coordination too. So um, that's what we were. Yeah, that's great. And I think the actual evaluation, Cam the Camden Coalition evaluation, is looking at very, very similar outcomes. So looking at utilization, healthcare usage, readmission rates, but also looking at costs because a key part of this intervention is, so it's not just about uh, quality of care, it's about uh, costs. Can this be an effective way to reduce costs in the healthcare system? And then I think, I don't know, did anybody, as you were thinking through the questions and the outcomes you'd want to look at, think about how you would measure these outcomes potentially? What what your measurement tools would be, would you need to run surveys, because these are the important questions to consider. Yes, we, we thought surveys would be good, uh, especially for patient satisfaction and, and also uh, serving the medical professionals that are trying to implement these practices and whether they're satisfied with the, their work conditions and whether they think the patients are actually doing what they're supposed to do, the recommended treatment. Um, I think the medical record data is going to be really important, too, to just yeah. assess any changes in health status. And Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of time tomorrow we'll be in the roundtables, we'll be talking about uh, administrative data and how you can use that to answer some of the questions as data you collect anyway. So that's something we can talk about tomorrow as well, but just something to keep in mind. So target population, I want to talk about that, how you'd identify them, how you'd select them. So we were talking about um, this, this gentleman's program of medical debt relief, and this, this is going to bleed into a comparison group. Um, his, his organization takes care of debt, uh, medical debt for people who have a high, high level of debt, and we were talking about how do you compare that with another group. As a charitable organization, morally you don't want to say, we're going to relieve this person's debt, sorry, you're just going to have to live with it, and then compare those two. That's a difficult moral question to ask. Also. You could, you could look at it in the, here's a population that's going to receive that relief, and then there's everyone else, but you might not have access to any data on the impact of, quote unquote, everywhere, everyone else. However, when you look at the reality of trying to roll this out, not everyone is gonna have their debt relieved on the exact same day. So you actually have a built-in comparison group when you start to, start to look at the people whose debt was relieved in January versus February versus December. Every month is a time gap and creates a, a, a control group within this group that you're already studying to, so that you can kind of deal with that question of how do we not give this great gift to a person but still get some useful um, information in the time that they're not getting that gift. And can I ask two questions related to that? One is, of the population you're working with, do you have the resources to forgive debt for everybody? And then the other thing is, currently, what's the process by which you determine, say, who gets the program in January versus February versus? So your first question is, what? Uh, do you have the resources to ultimately do th and, and undo this debt relief for everybody in your target population? What we, uh, what we do, as former bill collectors, we've turned the industry upside down. We go out to the debt market and we buy the debt, just like a, a collection agency would. So we buy in, in packets, in, in, in portfolios, and these are millions of dollars at a time. And we have no idea who's in that portfolio, although we could get some, pre, you know, some early data on that, but we just abolish that in general. We do have criteria for, you know, for people who 
um, or three times poverty level or something like that. That's, that's how we get the, the, the people to work with. Now, the, the real challenge is how do we take that particular group that just happened to be fortunate enough, like John Oliver um, purchased in Texas for 9,000 people about $15 million worth of debt. He donated that portfolio to us. Now, there must be another 9,000 people in Texas who also owe medical debt, but how do we find them? And how do we make that comparison? It's a challenge. Yeah, and I guess the other thing is it sounds like uh, when you, when you, who gets this, who gets this is depending on wh which batch of data they happen to be in, whether you, whether it was in the batch you purchased in January or in February. Yeah, because they're large portfolios, we can send out uh, 1,000 letters a week or 1,000 letters a month and there would be a spacing. Okay. What, we're, what we would do from a moral point of view is we would immediately get it off their credit report. So whether they know it or not, they've been graced by having this forgiveness program. I see, and so I, I guess to go back to my original question, how, do you, well, how is the order determined in which people receive the letter? So you're sending it out, there has to be a bit of a gap. Uh, yeah. How do you determine who receives the first batch of letters versus the second batch of letters? And we don't have a... a um, uh, process for that. We take the portfolio, divide it into tranches or segments that we can start sending out the letters and doing our work. Okay. So yeah, so that's one, that's one point at which to consider, well, that could be a place where you introduce randomization or you think about how we're constructing this because if a certain type of person is, ends up more likely to receive the first batch of letters versus the second batch versus the third batch, that might pose problems for the type of comparison group, I think. But okay. uh, if it's random, that's... That's, that's certainly been done, and that's sort of similar to the rollout opportunity I was mentioning earlier. And uh, yeah, anyone else want to talk about the, how they constructed the comparison group as one method? Or anybody else decided no, we definitely don't want to do an RCT, or we might want to do just a pre-post analysis, or has my proselytizing entirely worked? And well, I'll just throw it open to the floor. Anybody else want to share lessons you learned from the group discussion or things you talked about, questions you had? We have about five minutes before lunch, so. Okay. I just had a question about the uh, size of the group. I want if your invention is really for a very So what will really determine what makes sense is what type of impact you'd like to see. So typically, I mean, just as a rule of thumb, if you think the program is going to have a very, very large impact, or you only care about a very large impact, you could get away with a smaller, group, smaller sample. But if you're trying to zero in on a smaller impact or just a normal size impact, you would need a larger sample. In that case, it might not make sense to do it. That having been said, you'd need to just think hard in general about what it means to get in it, to do an evaluation there because there, it's not that you just can't do an RCT. Any evaluation would have a problem picking up an impact with a small group. And so. Because this is sort of often the case when you're starting a new or adoption program, you have a pilot, uh, and so you have a pretty small N, yeah. and it's really difficult to provide compelling evidence just on the basis of a small pilot. Yeah, so I think at least if, if, if you're still at the pilot stage, it seems like there you should really focus your resources on process evaluations and making sure that the program's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. So I'd encourage you all to go check out uh, our sister organization, Innovations for Poverty Action, has something called the Goldilocks Toolkit. And uh, well, the reason it's called the Goldilocks Toolkit is it's what's the right amount of data to collect, not too much, not too little, just right. And uh, so, but one of the questions that answers is precisely, well, maybe our program isn't ripe for a randomized evaluation, maybe we're still at the pilot stage, what should we do? And this is something they talk through with a host of case studies. And so I'm happy to send you the link to that as well. But at that point, I think when you're at that small end pilot stage, you really want to make sure your program's at least delivering what it's supposed to be delivering. So input activities, outputs, that stage is happening. And then see, well, do we, if we're going to scale it up, at that point, should we start thinking about doing a randomized evaluation? Because should we be scaling it up without a compelling case of impact? The reason why I'm asking is that often what's challenging serving the high-risk population is that 
those, um, regardless of the type of intervention that you provide, that it is still, they're still going to um, come and utilize the services. So how do you deal with or manage like those type of difficulty and challenges when you're trying to show an outcome using the very rigorous evaluation? Yeah. So two things, one is the evaluation is still ongoing, so we're waiting on results. The other thing is I think <clears throat> a lot of the process questions, the, one of the JPL <clears throat> excuse me, staffers who's here, his name is Adam Baybutt, and uh, he works on the Camden project. So I think he'd be able to give you very specific answers on the process. So I encourage you to chat with him about precisely these implementation issues, how do you deal with that. But one, one thing I can say is more broadly in the abstract, oftentimes you'll do an evaluation of a program where you can't ethically or for some other reason deny people an intervention. And then what you'll end up evaluating is not necessarily the program itself, but an encouragement. So think back to the case with the lentils, right, earlier that Quentin mentioned. If people came to camp for, an, for, an immuni for a vaccine, they would get it. You can't deny people a vaccine, right? But what they were evaluating was not whether giving people a vaccine is effective or not. What they were evaluating was is giving people lentils an effective way to get people to come to the camp. And there, that, that's what's called an encouragement, right? And so you randomize the encouragement. And so that's what they did. So oftentimes you might do an encouragement design where, or say something like this, a program, a health program, you might randomize who receives informational flyers about it to say, well, is this an effective way to get people to come and use this program? And then you compare the people who received the encouragement versus those who didn't. But you never deny someone who actually came to the program the program. Any other final thoughts? So, yes. Um, and where that kind of comes in, and I don't know if you know in Camden how they got patient consent or anybody did, or what that looks like at a program level. I think for researchers, it's like informed consent, signed signature, but yeah. for large programs, consent becomes a little more gray. Yeah, and I think it varies from program to program. So again, I think this is, let me, I'm going to find Adam and pull him in because uh, he's best placed to answer these questions. But uh, I think sometimes you typically want to get consent before randomization. But uh, it might, it'll vary on a program to program basis, and also the situation which you're interacting with your population. What's that? So Todd, Hannah, Kenya, Elizabeth, thank you so much. They're all going to be around. I'll be around if you want to continue the conversation. And uh, we have lunch next for an hour. It's going to take place right outside here. So if you step out in the foyer, lunch is there. Feel free to have lunch around the high top tables. There are also two rooms to the right outside, which should have signs saying lunch seating, I believe. And you can also have lunch in there. Um, and we'll be reconvening here at 1 o'clock for Ashish Jha's presentation on uh, using evidence to inform uh, health policy in the US. So thanks, everyone, and uh, appreciate it.